Hello and welcome to this repair tutorial and today we're going to look at our Marantz PM30 amplifier. Um, if you look out and, and you're sort of doing searches for these amplifiers or you may also own one, there was also a Marantz PM30 special edition. Uh, you can sort of see from the front fascia straight away if you have the PM30 or the special edition, not only does it have special edition on, written on the front, but with the PM30 you also have separate bass and treble controls whereas on the special edition version you do not, you only have the balance control. So general specifications, so not a hugely powerful sort of um, domestic or, or should we say audio amplifier, so 35 watts per channel into 8 ohms and it delivers 40, 40 watts if you have a 4 ohm speaker load. Frequency response is 10 hertz to 60 kilohertz, and total harmonic distortion is 0.15%. The amplifier does support a moving magnet for a phono connection to a turntable, as standard, so there's no separate uh, preamplifier required. So that's 2.5 millivolts, which is standard, into a 47 kilo ohm uh, impedance direct from the cartridge itself. And then for the CD input, you have tuner also, aux tape one and tape two. You're looking at an input signal uh, of 150 millivolt and dimensions height 118 by width 420 and then depth uh, quite a deep amplifier this so that's 280 millimeters and overall weight is coming in at uh, 10 kilograms in total now when this amplifier came into the workshop the first thing was that it had never been opened before which is always a good sign i mentioned this previously on other repair tutorials. That means that no one has investigated what the issue is and you're dealing with the fault as it occurred. First thing off when you remove the top cover is to identify what's going on with the input protection fuse and as we've shown in the video here the fuse is blackened so that tells you that excess current has been drawn and the fuse rating for this amplifier because it's really an entry level is T1.0 amps so that's 1000 milliamp uh, time delay fuse which is fitted so first thing off then to replace this now what I'm also showing as well is if you turn the amplifier over you have this uh, service hatch inspection hatch and it gives you access to part of the main amplifier circuit board but not all of the connections then so for myself when I'm repairing these because I have a set routine as I go through I don't really uh, pay any attention to this on some of the Marantz amplifiers you actually um, almost like sort of cut off the securing lugs and then you then fit screws then so sometimes if there's service work being done over years you may see some of these um, metal tabs that have been cut and as I say someone has then done some form of repair work and then they've just fitted screws after that now the other thing um, when you look at this amplifier <clears throat> this is very common with this series so it could be the 30 series could be the 40 series or the 60 series they fundamentally use the main design of the amplifier for the for the main board is is pretty much the same okay okay there's some technical differences and some upgrades but it's using the same kind of arrangement and the reason why i mention that is that all of these amplifiers develop dry joints and these dry joints form on the output transistors and also on the driver transistors this is a voltage driver transistor which is also mounted on the heat sinks both left and right now this just happens okay so once you uh, sort of get the top off and then you're doing the initial measurement, if that fuse is blown, the first thing to do is just to verify that the output transistors have not failed. Now, if they haven't failed, then you're in a good position, really, because it would tend to indicate that probably what you're looking at are dry joints on the main board. And for this amplifier, it has Motorola Originals inside, which is terrific, uh, and they weren't short circuit. So I, I knew already that it was probably going to be the dry joint issue. Now before I sort of get into that, what you have to do is just to remove the back panel, and I've shown this on many videos before, you'll see that there are screw holes which connect through to the grounding terminal on the speakers. All right, So I'm not talking about um, the negative speaker terminal, there is a common uh, ground connection or electrical connection with the main amp board which goes through the back plane via the speaker terminals, and I'm showing both the speaker terminals and the sort of the centre metal uh, ground part. The reason to mention that is if you're going to go into test mode after you've done the repair you must ensure that those screws are fitted and that common connection is made. If you don't fit it or you don't fit the screws and then the screws on the back panel you don't have to put all of them on 
it, it will damage the output transistors then and then you know that'll be a cost of repair or maybe a repair which is beyond uh, economical so first off here is again a systematic approach and i always mention this is that i'll focus on the dry joints that form on the input board so these are the rca input sockets and often there are cracks around there so just take care of all of those and then I'm also looking as well at the interconnecting cables. Some of them are wired in via multi-pin connectors where you have to just pull up the locking mechanism then you can extract them then. So I'm just verifying that those are all good. And then what I also do as well is I rotate the input selection switch to fully left or fully right. That just moves this ribbon cable connector. And then I just unclip the plastic part where it clips onto the main switch. And then I desolder the switch. Again, very, very common for amplifiers of this age and this type of design. What I show in the video is the internals of the slide switch. And what you can see is there is oxidization on the contacts. So I use a fiberglass pencil just to remove all of the oxidization. And then I'll then apply some deoxid grease just to make sure you've got good lubrication. Whatever you do, don't use sandpaper. You know, that's the last thing you want to do because you'll score the metal parts and it's not going to be a good outcome. And then once that's done, I then just reassemble the switch and solder it back into the board. At that stage of the repair, I don't reconnect the ribbon cable. I do just purely for tests, make sure everything is good. But then I unclip it again because later you have to remove the tone control board. Uh, and I'll come to that in a moment. So once that is then done, I then move across to the main amp board. So you have to remove four fixing screws and there are two metal tabs towards the front and you have to push those with a large flat blade screwdriver to bend them out of the way. Then there are PCB pillars, squeeze them with pliers and then lift the board up. And then you will be able to get access then to the underneath of the board. You may have to disconnect some of the interconnecting cables, straightforward enough, just lift up the locking mechanism and then just remove them. And then as I'm showing in the video, and I've shown multiple photographs here, I'm showing you the dry joints on both the output transistors and the voltage driver transistors. And you can see these cracks around. So that's what's caused the fuse to blow. So straightforward, you know, don't be sparse on the solder, you know, put some good quality um, and a quantity of solder on those larger connections. And then I also look across the board. You may find some in the power supply section of, of the amp board. Just reflow as required. Also look at the speaker terminals as well. Make sure there's no cracks around there because anything that has mechanical stress will fail. And then also the grounding lugs, which you can see uh, when you turn the board over. This is where the locking screws to the main chassis go through. Resolder all of those. Now for me, and I've seen many repair videos where people have undertook work, but they don't seem to focus very much on the speaker protection relay. But I do show this. On all amplifiers that come into the workshop of any age, you know, if they're like you know 10 years plus, you must look at that speaker protection relay because it will have become oxidized and resistive. For me, I just block change it out. So I'll put in a brand new 24 volt. It is a sealed relay, so it has more longevity with high quality contacts. That removes any future issues that the customer will see where you could have distorted sound at low volume or intermittent loss of sound. And sometimes like on YouTube, you see repair videos where people tap the top of the relay and all of a sudden it will re-establish the connection. But that's because of the oxidization. Once that is done, I then move across to the power input board. And again, you can see that I've lifted up the board and what I'm showing are dry joints around the input or the power switch. So I just reflow these. Because this is quite a simple amplifier, there's not really any sort of major issue. You know, you, you don't have like a startup transformer or anything like that. So you know, it's just, you know, a couple of solder connections that you have to do. You don't normally find any dry joints on the power supply protection fuse either. And then the next part is just to remove the screw. So I'm able then to uh, pull forward the fascia. Now, because this is the PM30, you will need to remove the locking screws which hold in place the balance, treble and then base control. And then at the rear you have two countersunk screws which are on the input selection switches and then one screw which holds in the headphone socket. What I do then is I just turn that over and then lift up and then I'm showing this in the video. You will see always dry solder connections on the headphone socket and also on the user control. So this is commonly the base 
treble and balance control so reflow them you may also find some drawer joints on the selection switches for this amplifier there wasn't but sometimes you can find them slightly cracked so i would advise you then to reflow and then as a matter of course just uh, spray into those selection switches some deoxid and just work those switches multiple times and that will then clean them up and then the final part that i sort of focus on is the volume control potentiometer now this amplifier during test you had intermittent loss of sound but due to the volume control so i'm kind of figuring this amplifier may be been in storage for a period of time and the, the environment was slightly damp so by removing the volume control potentiometer just pull the knob off and then you can then release the locking screw there's just a washer metal washer around it so just put that to one side for refitting later and then spray underneath directly into the, the uh, carbon tracks the two gangs for the potentiometer and for me i probably have to work this thing backwards and forwards more more than 30 times all right just to make sure that all oxidization or, or, or sort of dirt or accumulation was clear off the carbon tracks and then it was very very smooth clean and then no issue then with loss of sound and then the final part uh, really is the assembly so you've got to reassemble the amplifier and then what i'm then doing as i show here is i just do the final adjustment for the output bias so when you look from the top you have dual emitter resistors and it's very easy here because you have the leads of the emitter resistors come out the top and then I can then clip on some connectors there and I leave the amplifier probably running for about 15 to 20 minutes because there'd be no sort of repair work or components replaced in the output stage really there was no adjustment to be made after about 15 20 minutes then you know it's about 14.2 millivolts so just a slight tiny adjustment but nothing major and then by just connecting the multimeter leads to the output speaker terminals I could verify you know if there was any DC offset and there wasn't you know the protection circuit wasn't uh, operating or anything like that so that really sort of con concludes uh, this repair video uh, what I'd also mention as well, just in passing, is you don't tend to find this brown glue that I've often mentioned for the PM30 or for the special edition on some of the 40 series and definitely on the 60 series. You saw it, um, but thankfully not in this case. So that just removes that additional work that you have to do. Um, and what is common with all amplifiers where you have these large grills on the top for heat dissipation you'll probably need as i did in this case you'll you'll just need to use a compressed airline or maybe a, a long stiff brush just to clear out all of the dust at different stages but once that's done you know there was no liquid damage or anything like that with this amplifier so that sort of comes to conclusion there so uh, thank you very much for stopping by and if you have any questions or you need any support by all means email audio amplifier servicing at aol.com and I'll, of course, respond back and give you any guidance or information you may require. Until the next time, cheers. Bye-bye.